Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome to you all and to this GTC Scotland lecture on Graham Donaldson's report, Teaching Scotland's Future, uh, 10 years on. Uh, I'm Ken Muir, the Chief Executive of the General Teaching Council for Scotland, and uh, I'm delighted to say that such is the interest in this lecture this afternoon that it's attracted over a thousand participants, uh, not just from Scotland, but from uh, colleagues in the Education Workforce Council in Wales, from England, and from the General Teaching Council in Northern Ireland, and also from as far afield as Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa and uh, Canada. Uh, I'm sure that by now you'll all be familiar with how such online events uh, are conducted, but if I could just ask that you keep your microphones muted and that you use the chat function if you have any questions that arise during Graham's presentation. And, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with Microsoft Teams, there's a live chat Q&A tab on the right hand side of your screen into which you can write your question. And when you've typed your question with your name and where you're from, just press return and it will wing our way uh, to us. Uh, and the chat function, as I say, is how we'll take your questions uh, this afternoon rather than get you to actually ask them uh, in live time. And Graham will respond to them. And while we're talking about questions, I want to offer a big thanks to those of you who have already submitted questions. We'll try to get through as many of those as possible and as many that are asked during the lecture before the end of the event at six o'clock this evening. As well as having Graham Donaldson presenting, there are two other people I would like to introduce who are with us uh, and supporting the lecture this afternoon. Uh, firstly, Pauline, Pauline Stephen, who is currently uh, the Director of Education, Registration and Professional Learning here at GTC Scotland uh, and who will take over from me as Chief Executive when I retire on the 12th of March and Pauline will be facilitating the Q&A session and as I say she'll read out any of your questions, uh, say who they're from and give Graham the opportunity to reply uh, to them. And secondly, I'm delighted to welcome John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills who has joined us for the lecture. Uh, I know just how busy a time it is for the DFM and I'm really pleased that he's able to attend and he's agreed to offer uh, a first response to what Graham has to say uh, after the lecture. We're almost ready to go with the lecture itself, but there's first of all one very important and very pleasant duty that I have to perform first. Uh, this GTC Scotland lecture has been used to launch the refreshed and restructured suite of professional standards for teachers, which will take effect from the 2nd of August uh, this year. And I want to say something about that as part of the launch. The current suite of standards uh, has been in place since 2012 and GTC is committed to reviewing these uh, every five years. And as we're all aware, the world has changed a lot since 2012 and the standards review has tried to take into account the impact of as many of those changes that we've seen in our professional world uh, since then. Changes such as the implementation of professional update, which we launched in 2014, uh, on ongoing uh, curriculum developments and changes such as uh, the refresh of the Curriculum for Excellence narrative, and we've also taken account as best we can of the contemporary national and international research on standards and, and developments in recent years in the notion of teacher professionalism. Our standards review has also uh, very importantly allowed us to take the view of registrants and stakeholders on how we address the critically important question of what does it mean to be a teacher in Scotland in the second decade of the 21st century? and the refreshed and restructured standards and the support package that we uh, will be preparing around them allows us also to respond to the OECD's 2015 report on improving schools in Scotland, which said that in Scotland the professional standards are bold and supportive, but it also raised a question about how well embedded they are in practice and part of the support that we're putting around the professional standards will be designed to try and address that itself. The refreshed and restructured professional standards 2021, which I'm launching today, are the product of extensive collaboration, uh, engagement and consensus building across the Scottish education system. 
And it's been overseen by a strategic group and a number of working groups over the past three years, made up of wide representation from the profession, uh, whose early ideas for change in the standards uh, we took account of. And a way back in 2018, we, we engaged in a six month period of national conversation to address the initial findings from the various working groups. As part of that, we commissioned a literature review from Professor Marjorie McMahon from Glasgow University, who I believe is with us today and who is world renowned for our work on professional standards. And we also commissioned uh, research from children in Scotland to seek the views of children and young people on what they thought made a good teacher. And that report is a more than worthwhile read on the GTC uh, website. Uh, we produced an initial set of draft professional standards, which went out for public consultation in 2019. And in March 2020, we uh, re-established a writing group to further refine those standards. And from last August, again, we had a process of consultation through 15 focus groups who offered further changes to the presentation and the language in the standards, which helped to improve the coherence, the clarity, uh, and the consistency. And at the same time, uh, those fora offer very helpful suggestions on the kinds of materials that registrants uh, would like to see to support their engagement and enactment of the professional standards. So I want to say something about how the professional standards have changed from, 2020, from 2012 to 2021. Uh, the, main, the main structural change is a separation of the standards for provisional and full registration and the standard for middle leadership, uh, middle leaders and the standard for headship. We have separated them into discrete documents. We're focused on making the language of the standards more accessible. Uh, and we've done things like reframing some fundamental aspects of teacher, professionalis uh, teacher professionalism, such as uh, leadership. And we've also enhanced significantly the focus on areas such as equality and diversity, uh, learning for sustainability, additional support needs, uh, inquiry, digital literacy across the suite of the five professional standards. And the extensive engagement we've had with the profession in each phase of the pro process has actually allowed us to refer to the professional standard standards as, as belonging to us collectively, the teaching professionals of Scotland and the improvements we've made to them we know will make a significant contribution to further enhancing teacher professionalism and teachers professional learning. And finally, the, the review of the standards has allowed us to explore the contemporary notion of teacher professionalism in Scotland. We have taken the opportunity through the lens of the, the restructured and refreshed standards to, to reposition the centrality of education and teaching professionals really as the social glue that supports and promotes the building of better futures for all, all our children and young people. Something that, as we're all aware, is critical at all times, but never more so than now. So ladies and gentlemen, the refreshed and restructured professional standards for teachers now launched are available now on the GTC Scotland website. Uh, I don't know if they will top the best sellers list this year, but they'll certainly do a lot to enhance teacher professionalism and the quality of learning and teaching experienced by all our children and young people in the years to come. So thank you for that and I hope you enjoy uh, reading them. Turning to the lecturer itself and our presenter, Graham Donaldson. Graham uh, needs very little introduction. He's one of the best known and most respected educationists in Scottish education uh, and worldwide. Uh, as a former senior chief inspector in HMIE uh, and my boss at the time, Graham was responsible for radically reforming the approach that we took to inspection, combining external accountability with self-evaluation and capacity building. And as chief professional advisor to ministers in education, he has played a leading role in many of the major education reform programmes we've seen in, in recent years. Following Graham's retirement from HMIE, his report, Teaching Scotland's Future, was published in January 2011, a decade ago. 
Uh, in it, he made 50 recommendations about teacher education, all of which have contributed to our wider and ongoing reform programme that uh, we've engaged in in Scottish education. And more recently, Graham's undertaken a review of the National Curriculum in Wales, which culminated in his radical report, Successful Futures, which was published in 2015, and which has become a catalyst in Wales for a major long-term and ongoing reform programme, driving change in Welsh education. Graham has worked as an international expert for OECD. He's taken part in the reviews of education in countries like Australia, uh, Portugal and Sweden. He was made a companion of the Order of the Bath by the Queen in 2009 and he was given the Robert Owen Award in Scotland as an inspirational educator by the Scottish Government in 2015. He's an honorary professor at the University of Glasgow, uh, an advisor to Minister for Education and Skills in Wales and how he finds the time I'm not entirely sure but he's also a member of the First Minister's International Council of education advisors. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, having launched the 2021 uh, Professional Standards for Teachers as part of this lecture, it's great with great pleasure. Uh, I now ask Graham to present his lecture on the Donaldson Report, Teaching Scotland's Future, 10 years on. I want to begin by thanking the General Teaching Council for Scotland for the invitation to share my thoughts on Teaching Scotland's Future, 10 years on. Can I also wish Ken my best wishes for a long and happy retirement? We've known each other for at least 30 years, and I'm sure that Ken will have many requests to continue his lifelong commitment to Scotland's young people and to share his expertise internationally. And of course, congratulations to Pauline on a new role at the head of this vitally important organisation. The importance that Scotland attaches to education can be traced back at least to its 15th century town grammar schools and universities in St Andrews, Aberdeen and Glasgow, and to the groundbreaking 1696 Act and the spread of parish schools nationally. While the fabled ladder perts may overstate the real extent of educational opportunity, we have seen then a strong and consistent commitment in Scotland to the importance of education and in particular to high standards of literacy across the population. A recent curriculum reform and even teaching Scotland's future itself can both be seen as modern examples of that commitment. The 1960s is a period from which much of our modern landscape of Scottish education can be traced. In 1964, responsibility for examinations passed from HM inspectors to a new body, the Scottish Certificate of Education Examination Board, a precursor to today's Scottish Qualifications Authority. In the following year, questions about the nature of the school curriculum also led to the creation of a new body, the Consultative Committee on the Curriculum, whose framework of central committees allowed a substantial measure of professional agency in determining the direction of educational reform. Foreshadowed by the primary memorandum in 1965, the succeeding couple of decades saw, rad saw radical developments in both the curriculum and examinations with the teaching profession, or at least a section of the profession, as Walter Humes reminds us, in the vanguard of reform. Names such as Munn, Dunning and Pack will be familiar to at least some of you listening to this lecture. I've highlighted these developments as a period in which the status of the teaching profession grew significantly, leading to it becoming much more influential in the nature and direction of reform nationally. The 55 years since then have seen the power and influence of the profession wax and wane in response to an increasingly volatile political debate about education. However, the most significant challenge then and now was summed up in 1966 by the then Secretary of State for Scotland, Willie Ross, when he said, do our teachers receive the best and most appropriate preparation for the schools of today and tomorrow? This was a challenge I was asked to address when I was invited to undertake the review that ultimately led to the report Teaching Scotland's Future. While today's lecture is not directly about the impact of the pandemic, I want to begin by expressing my deep admiration for the teachers and education staff generally throughout Scotland who are continuing to serve their pupils conscientiously and often creatively despite all the pressures and anxieties that the current situation brings. The high regard in which Scottish teachers are held by parents and the wider community can only have been enhanced by the selfless dedication of so many over the last few months. Much has already changed since January 2011 when TSF was published 
but the impact of COVID-19 has added an important further dimension of uncertainty as we consider where Scottish education might go over the next decade and beyond. To address this broad question, my starting point is to consider a number of trends and forces that will shape the context for the profession for at least the next decade. I do not intend to offer an extended analysis of national and international trends and forces. However, it's clear that the world of 2021 is different from the world of 2010, and those trends and forces of change that we can already see suggest that the world of 2031 will be very different again. The challenge for education systems is to remain relevant in such a volatile context. What are some of these trends and forces? First, we seem to be entering a new phase of globalisation. Countries are increasingly interdependent, as reflected in shifting global supply lines, climate change, environmental degradation, migration, etc. We also see a globalisation of human creativity and collaboration as scientists and engineers come together to tackle the many facets of the global pandemic. At the same time, an upsurge of protectionism and populism appears to be inhibiting the kind of international cooperation that generally characterised the post-war period. Employment patterns and the demand for particular skills are less predictable than in the past. The wealth of multinational companies exceeds many small countries and their ability to influence national and international decision making has continued to grow. Social issues arising, for example, from demographic changes, migration, identity and faith challenge conventional assumptions and give rise to complex and contested policy debates. It also seems likely that as technology displaces current jobs and feeds greater interactivity, there will be continuing disruptions, but also fresh opportunities for today's young people to influence and prosper, both as individuals and as citizens. Although it be presumptuous of me to try to predict the future, it's clear that the world that today's young people will live and earn a living in as adults will be very different from today. And of course, there's the unknowable impact of the pandemic on how we all think how we will all think and act in the future. Significant changes to established ways of living and working have been brought about by the actions taken to combat the effects of the pandemic. Medical triage consultations are increasingly online and likely to be an established part of future practice. Shops, restaurants and businesses generally have all moved to significant online working. Less tangibly, we have all had our appreciation of family and community reinforced by the exigencies of isolation and lockdown. The most vulnerable have been affected disproportionately, reinforcing existing inequalities and presenting fresh policy and practice challenges. Indeed, one of the lessons from the pandemic must be the need to establish necessary resilience in our systems in anticipation of future shocks. Hierarchical relationships are ill-suited to the kind of creativity and flexibility that quick, sensitive and customised responsiveness demands. What such, what such considerations might mean for the future can only be speculative. However, it's important that we reflect and try to build on what we've learned in the last 10 months if we are to shape that future positively. Necessity can often be the mother of invention. The first and critical point I want to make is that Teaching Scotland's Future saw Scotland's teachers as the key asset in its education system, and that remains my view. The quality of the teacher is central to the well-being and the success of Scotland's young people. Teaching Scotland's Future had a vision for the teaching profession. It saw teachers as valued and respected professionals, leading educational thinking, working in collaboration with colleagues and empowered to take decisions in the best interests of all of their students. Teachers that are committed to and supported in career-long professional learning, participating in and drawing on research evidence in pursuit of the learning and well-being of pupils. A reflective and trusted profession that is dedicated to Scotland's future, its young people. As with the original report, the task is to create the conditions for the full potential of the teaching profession to be realised. That means attracting the right people into teaching, maintaining strong professional values, being clear about the learning that matters for their pupils, equipping teachers with fundamental and relevant knowledge and skills, establishing the conditions necessary for them to continue to grow and develop professionally throughout their careers, and creating the space for them to exercise those skills in pursuit of the learning and well-being of their pupils. The recommendations in the original report sought to pursue these goals and there's evidence from the five-year impact study in 2015 of real progress since its publication. Looking ahead to the next decade and beyond, there are clear areas for further development. We must reinforce teaching as a vital, exciting and rewarding vocation 
that attracts people who are first and foremost committed to children's learning and well-being. We must ensure that teachers teach and children experience and learn what matters most for their future success and well-being. In addition to continuing to improve levels of literacy and numeracy and to raise standards across the curriculum, we need to develop pedagogies that harness the unique contributions of both face-to-face -face and digital learning. We need to reinforce the importance of values, ethics and critical thinking as key components of responsible citizenship. We need to reassert the prime role of assessment for and as learning and develop qualifications that reflect the purposes of the curriculum. We need to reassert the need for and implications of career-long professional learning, including genuine collaboration involving schools, universities and local authorities. And we need to strike a much better balance between teaching time and time beyond the classroom devoted to research and reflection, building professional capital and analyse and meeting, analysing and meeting the diverse needs of pupils. I want to say a little more about each of these developments. The creation of the GTC in 1965 attests to the importance Scotland attaches to ensuring that those responsible for the education of its young people have the attributes necessary for high quality teaching and learning. Ian Matheson, in his history of the first 50 years of GTCS, Milestones and Minefields, skillfully charts the period leading up to the formation of the then GTC in 1965. He cites the immediate post-war period as seeing significant pressures on schools as the baby boomers moved into formal education. In addition, the raising of the school age to 15 in 1947 added further resource pressure. Scotland needed to find enough teachers to cope with the growing demand for schooling, leading to large numbers of what were described as uncertificated teachers being employed, with over 2,000 in post by 1960. Against this background, there were growing demands for a teacher registration scheme culminating in the establishment of the General Teaching Council. The new GTC oversaw entry to the profession and head teachers took over responsibility from HMI for assessing the competence of probationer teachers. The creation of the GTC was a significant move towards recognising teaching as a self-governing profession and that should not be underestimated. 2012 saw the next stage in that process with full independence and the embedding of GTCS as a world leader in establishing teaching as a self-regulating profession. Teaching Scotland's future stressed the importance of being clear about the basis for entry into the profession. In particular, it called for rigorous and broadly based selection of students applying to enter teacher education. And that would require a better understanding of the qualities that prospective students should possess and improved assessment of those qualities prior to entry. Thereafter, Teaching Scotland's future envisaged a more extended period of formation spanning university courses, induction and support during an early phase of a teacher's career. Much closer partnership working across universities, local authorities and schools was seen as essential if the then rather disjointed, even haphazard experience of new teachers was to be overcome. Placements would be jointly planned to avoid a false distinction between theory and practice being reinforced. All of this was to be supported by the approval of courses in the framework of standards that GTCS had responsibility for. Part of the context was also a debate in the UK about how best to prepare teachers for their future roles. In England, there was a significant shift in government policy towards responsibility for preparation, moving from universities to schools. There have been intense debates about the motivation behind such policies, but the evidence I gathered in my review reinforced the view that society's expectations, the rapidly changing economic environment, and our growing understanding about learning and the multiple needs of learners all pointed to teaching as an increasingly complex and challenging endeavour that required theory, research and practice to be balanced appropriately. Most of the 50 recommendations of TSF were therefore focused on building teachers' capacity in curriculum making, as well as on pedagogy, assessment and, of course, meeting the needs of young people in all of their diversity. The intention was to bring about a reinvigoration of professionalism and a reconceptualisation of teacher education. Looking from the standpoint of 2021, I think that the recommendations of TSF relating to entry into teaching still hold good and should continue to be pursued with determination. My second point of focus is I need to be very clear about what we as a profession stand for. Strong values should underpin all that we do. I was delighted that the 2012 revision of the GTCS standards placed values right at the forefront. I'm equally delighted that the current revision takes, takes this further highlighting the professional values of social justice, trust, respect and integrity 
I strongly endorse the statement on the GTCS website that says commitment to reflecting on the connections between values and actions and career-long professional action, uh, career-long professional learning is a critical part of developing teacher professionalism. My third area is the need for clarity about what young people should learn and teachers should therefore teach. The nature and content of the school curriculum has become highly contested across the world. The background to Teaching Scotland's future was the creation of the Scottish Parliament with education as a key aspect of the new Parliament's responsibilities. A national debate about education had prompted a very significant shift in curriculum policy in Scotland, accompanied by mounting concerns about the attainment gap between the country's most and least deprived young people. Curriculum for Excellence, CFE, sought to give our young people a broad 21st century education in pursuit of four overarching capacities. These were that young people should be supported to become successful learners, confident individuals, effective contributors and responsible citizens. CFE aimed for deep learning and higher standards. It targeted well-being as well as literacy and numeracy. It promoted engaging, imaginative and purposeful pedagogy and it highlighted the value of achievements beyond traditionally measured attainment. It also promoted a new paradigm of governance and change within which there would be less prescription and much greater scope for schools and teachers to shape the learning experiences of their young people. The purpose of this lecture is not to discuss the merits of CFE or to evaluate its effect effectiveness. However, it's perhaps worth stressing that, contrary to some of the recent debate, CFE did not deny the importance of subjects or of formal knowledge. It did advocate a greater focus on enabling our young people to combine and apply knowledge in different and unfamiliar contexts, an approach we have seen working spectacularly in recent vaccine developments. On raising standards in literacy and numeracy for all, on promoting health and well-being, and on helping young people to develop the knowledge, insights and values that would allow them to be responsible citizens in an increasingly fast-changing, complex and challenging national and global environment. The strong performance of Scottish pupils in the recent OECD survey of global competencies provides reassurance that perhaps aspects of the hoped-for benefits of CFE are bearing fruit. Curriculum for Excellence was a seminal and forward-looking reform that in many ways continues to influence curriculum thinking internationally. That said, in my view, we should keep the curriculum under constant review, particularly in today's volatile environment. CFE is now 15 years old and it, it is appropriate to question and evaluate how far it continues to reflect the needs and aspirations of our young people. The challenge is to create a process for smooth and continuous curriculum renewal. Such an approach can help to avoid the kind of periodic bursts of activity that can often be undertaken in response to a build-up of real or sometimes overblown concerns. Irrespective of any reconsideration of the design of the curriculum, there are a number of areas where schools and teachers need clarity now. The first relates to the implications of digital technologies for teaching and learning. I've already highlighted the probable lasting impact that technology will have on significant aspects of how we live, relate and earn a living. Schools have also been at the forefront of developing new ways of working. Closure of school buildings during the pandemic has required quick and creative thinking about how to preserve as much continuity in young people's learning as possible. Teachers and parents have had to think carefully about what and how to support learning in this new context. At its best, we've seen creative ways of enhancing homeschool collaboration. Long-standing assumptions about teaching and learning <coughs> have been challenged in the last 10 months, and it seems unlikely that things will simply revert to how they were before. New technologies were already affecting education pre-pandemic, but have been given added impetus, impetus from the experience of the last year. Their potential to enhance learning is huge, but only if we understand how best to harness that potential. How can we build on this platform to find appropriate synergies between face-to-face -face and digital pedagogies? We're already seeing important developments in the use of technology to support learning out of school. <clears throat> the national extension of eScoil has been accompanied by regional developments such as the West Partnership's online lesson bank. It seems probable that the profession's confidence and competence in using technology will have been significantly enhanced by the experience of the last 10 months. At the same time, many young people have seen fresh possibilities in digital learning and their capacity and willingness to learn independently will have been enhanced, but that will by no means have been universal. Digital learning out of school requires resources and the right environment for, and for too many young people, the gaps stemming from relative advantage have widened. We now need a major effort to research digitally enhanced learning and to understand digital pedagogy as being much more than making classroom 
lessons available at a distance. Crucially, we need to establish the kinds of relationship between in-school face-to-face learning and learning that can be pursued in out-of-school settings, supported as appropriate by digital connectivity. The possibilities for independent learning, for example through flipped classrooms, look to me to deserve in-depth examination. For many young people and their families, these possibilities have become a reality during the periods of interrupted schooling. Much of that will continue, irrespective of what happens formally. However, if we do not think through the implications, inequalities and in access to learning will be exacerbated. If we are to avoid such negative effects, we need to create community resources to support out-of-school learning for all of our young people. I have no doubt that continuing developments in digital pedagogies will have significant implications for how people, young people learn and for their well-being. In updating Teaching Scotland's future, I believe that if we are to build positively from today's necessity to tomorrow's normality, we will need a major national focus on how best to equip schools, teachers and the wider community to engage creatively with the challenges and opportunities posed by digitisation. <coughs> A second area where we need further consideration and greater clarity in the curriculum relates to how we develop our young people to develop ethical understanding and personal values. The last decade has exposed underlying worldwide tensions about values and hitherto accepted societal norms. Assumptions about representative democracy, for example, are being challenged in ways that require all of us to remain vigilant. Fake news and alternative facts supporting emotional ideological positions challenge Scottish Enlightenment principles that have shaped the last 250 years of our history. This is a complex and sensitive area for education, but it's not one that we can ignore. History teachers must constantly address issues involving competing value positions, as we see in today's consideration about slavery and empire. I also well remember heated debates about whether modern studies should be an optional or universal component of the secondary curriculum. To its credit, Scotland has already recognised the importance of such matters and included responsible citizen citizenship as one of CFE's four capacities. That capacity should be about more than understanding the social and political norms and processes that govern our lives as citizens. We now need to recognise the complexity of how we approach values in education and support schools and teachers in helping to develop the capacity for all, that capacity in all of our young people to participate in society as ethical and informed citizens. The third area where I think that schools and teachers need greater, greater clarity relates to assessment. The last couple of decades have seen increasing confusion about the role that assessment can and should play in helping young people to learn. Although Scotland has made important strides with assessment for learning, we still have a rather confused set of practices across the country. In particular, an undue focus on summative assessment for reporting and accountability has detracted from its formative and ipsative roles. We need to reassert the central role of assessment in helping young people to progress in their learning and avoid the negative effects of a real or perceived high-stakes assessment culture. That means being clear about who needs what information from assessment and about the role of self-assessment and peer assessment as well as assessment that is teacher-directed. Recent experience with the suspension of a formal examination diet has, I think, opened up important fresh possibilities about how we can increase the validity of qualifications. The case for examinations rests partly on society's need to select people fairly for future roles. Reliability is therefore a priority. It's also argued that examinations help young people to demonstrate their ability to work under pressure. However, examinations are at best only a very limited way of measuring learning in all its complexity and are a relatively poor predictor of subsequent success in university courses. If qualifications are to remain relevant to the needs of society and the economy, then they should reflect competencies that go beyond the kind of learning that formal examinations can measure. Schools can assess the ability to be creative and to apply learning in ways that cannot be achieved in a formal exam setting. We need to establish a much better balance between internal and external assessment and a broader range of types of evidence uh, that count. In moving to give schools more responsibility in assessment for qualifications, however, we need to be very clear about when and how evidence of performance should be gathered. There is a danger that continuous assessment can become continuous testing. The accumulation of evidence over time could favour speed of learning and penalise those who may take longer to learn but nonetheless achieve the desired outcomes. Making mistakes is an important part of learning and should not lead inadvertently to a lower grade. We also need to ensure fairness through intelligent moderation that guards against inconsistency in standards and un unintentional bias. Good assessment is one of the most complex aspects of a teacher's job. 
It requires clarity about what evidence of learning counts as success and the skills to secure that evidence in ways that do not distort or compromise the process of learning itself. Assessment is too often relegated to being the Cinderella of professional learning. As we move forward, it will be vital to ensure that schools and teachers are able to apply best practice and assessment both within day-to-day -day teaching and learning and as part of improving the validity of qualifications. Given the recruitment of able and committed people into teaching and given clarity about the purpose and nature of the curriculum, the next challenge is to ensure that all teachers are supported to grow and develop professionally throughout their careers. The question addressed by Teaching Scotland's Future was similar to the one that Willie Ross posed in 1966. What needs to happen to support teachers to be able to take the opportunities offered by CFE and to realise its benefits for Scotland's young people? The broad conclusion I reached in 2010 and still believe today is that Scotland needs to invest more in building the confidence and capacity of the teaching profession to play a much larger role in shaping the edu educational experiences of our young people, the why, the what, as well as the how of learning. The term extended professionalism was first introduced by Eric Hoyle back in 1974, signalling, I think, a view of teachers as reflective practitioners with real agency. Andy Hargreaves helpfully went further in 1994 by describing modern professionalism as involving the exercise of discretionary judgment within conditions of unavoidable and perpetual uncertainty. Andy's elaboration seems to me to point us in a direction that was prescient then and even more relevant now. Teaching Scotland's Future sought to reinforce the importance of professional learning that is embedded in practice and has direct impact on young people's learning and well-being. The 2015 impact study found, and I quote, the teaching profession has risen to the challenge set out in Teaching Scotland's Future and that there was evidence of real progress in many areas of teacher education and above all, there's been a significant shift in the culture of professional learning. These findings point to considerable progress in a relatively short period. So far, so good. Collaborative inquiry within professional learning communities continues to provide the best opportunities for the realisation of sustained improvements in teaching and learning. Developments such as regional improvement collaboratives provide real possibilities for the further embedding of collaboration. However, collaboration does not in itself guarantee improvement. The dangers of groupthink or of the dominance of particular interests remain. We need, therefore, to explore how appropriate external involvement can be facilitated in ways that do not disempower schools and re-establish a culture of compliance. One source of such external support lies in our universities, and we need to capitalise on their potential in supporting collaborative inquiry. Cross-sectoral networks provide another important means of introducing different perspectives. As part of work involving Glasgow and Strathclyde universities and a number of local authorities in the west of Scotland, I was struck by the comments from teachers and students involved in joint primary-secondary placements about how much they learned by seeing each other's approaches at first hand. Similar benefits can also arise from cross-departmental working in secondary schools. We need to ensure that our networks include experience and perspectives that can challenge established assumptions and further enhance our understanding of excellent teaching and learning. The final area I want to explore relates to the question of school and teacher agency. While Scottish teachers have not been constrained by a statutory national curriculum, it would probably be true to say that a variety of forces tended to promote fairly high degrees of uniformity and conformity. One of the transformative aspects of Curriculum for Excellence was the extent to which it sought to broaden the scope for schools and teachers to shape as, to shape as well as deliver the curriculum. Mark Priestley, Gert Biesta and Sarah Robinson describe such teacher agency as being conditioned by the interaction of individual capacity with environmental condi conditions. In other words, good teachers need to be given the space and scope to use their skills to the full. This is not the place to discuss external guidance and accountability and broader questions of culture. Suffice to say that the impact of major investment in building the capacity of the profession will be diluted if matters of design, accountability and culture are not also addressed. Scottish Government policy in recent years has been directed towards lessening the extent of external direction. Policy, however, can only go so far and we need to pursue deep cultural change at all levels in the system. Those of us who are in positions of authority whether outside the classroom, head teachers, local authority and national staff, for example, need to understand the importance of context and seek to establish respectful and trusting relationships with teachers. Our key skills should lie in the leadership of ideas and in coaching and mentoring, reinforcing high expectations and supporting reflection, continuous learning and improvement. Time 
is the currency of teaching. The conditions that govern how teachers spend their time dictate, in many ways, how far our ambitions for young, people, young people's education will be realised. Much of the political debate, and often the focus of collective bargaining, has been directed towards maximising the time teachers spend in front of a class. Both the Macron and McCormick reports pointed the way towards a broader, nation, broader definition of teacher professionalism and productivity. We tend not to talk explicitly about productivity in schools, but it's important for us to be clear about how we use available resources, particularly the expertise of teachers, to best effect for pupils. Teaching is about much more than effective instruction, important though that undoubtedly is. Today's teachers need time to plan high quality learning experiences if they are to develop capacities, raise standards and meet the diverse needs of pupils. Quality is not just about inspiration and performance, but about the considered application of professional knowledge and skills in highly complex environments. And quality needs the investment of time by both the individual teacher and the school. In other words, we need a further discussion about teacher productivity that understands that well-directed time outside the classroom is needed if our young people are to experience real high quality education. Teaching Scotland's Future advocated a more central place for universities and school education. I've been hugely impressed by the creative ways in which undergraduate and postgraduate degrees have been transformed, transformed in the period since 2010. The report also stressed the importance of much better collaboration amongst universities, local authorities and schools in helping to secure improvement across the system. The intention was to harness, harness the research capacity and professional expertise of universities in ways that impacted directly on schools and, importantly, on the learning of young people. Encouragingly, we've seen real progress in such collaboration in the last decade. Important steps have been taken to improve access to research. The Scottish Government's 2017 research strategy, strategy highlights the importance of research for practitioners and seeks to support the development of a research infrastructure and a focus of, on evidence of what works. I have to say I remain a little concerned, however, about the danger that there is somehow a what works recipe book to be followed by all teachers. We need research-aware teachers that can interrogate research findings and adapt and apply them judiciously in their particular context. Education Scotland encourages educators to take part in research and provides national support for its impact on teaching. The General Teaching Council gives all registered teachers free access to online journals through EBSCO. Importantly, GTCS standards signal the importance of engagement with research and its professional learning and professional recognition activities all contribute to a much richer research culture than was the case pre-2010. Individual university academics also continue to play a strong role in local development. Glasgow University's Robert Owen Centre, for example, has a broad programme of action research across Scotland. And Chris Chapman and I are directly involved on in the board of the West Partnership, playing a critical friend role and providing a direct link to the activities of staff in the Robert Owen Centre. I've only touched on some of the many activities currently in operation, and I'm aware of other developments in the pipeline. The challenge, however, is to continue to bring such activity into the classroom. The Scottish framework for masters in education builds on the Teaching Scotland's future aspiration that teachers throughout Scotland should be encouraged to engage in masters level learning and to gain university recognition for that learning. Cooperation across universities, universities with transfer of, of credits points the way to the kind of joint working that can only enhance their contribution to Scottish education. Interestingly, a parallel development in Wales has seen seven universities work together to create a single national masters in education which will be offered in each of the universities. The Welsh Government is supporting 500 teachers to go on that scheme. I've not dwelled on the importance of leadership, which was a major theme in Teaching Scotland's future. However, the kind of culture change that can be trained, traced back to the original CFE philosophy will remain at the heart of achieving the kind of vibrant system that Scotland needs and aspires to. That requires a sophisticated understanding of modern leadership. In many ways, successful leadership is about clarity of purpose, realising the potential of staff at all levels and modelling reflective learning behaviours. Investment in building the confidence and capacity of teachers is the single best way to improve the quality of classroom learning. I saw the Scottish College of Educational Leadership as being central to the success of the Teaching Scotland's Future Agenda and I remain of the view that we need to nurture educational leadership right from the outset of a career. We must be careful that the particular dimensions of leadership are not lost in wider professional learning strategies. 
The 50 recommendations of TSA, Teaching Scotland's Future, all focused on building teachers' capacity in curriculum making, as well as on pedagogy, assessment, and of course, meeting the needs of young people in all their diversity. The intention was to bring about a reinvigoration of professionalism and a reconceptualization of teacher education, as I said earlier. Good progress has been made, but much remains to be done. We will need visionary leadership at all levels that can inspire, support and empower teachers to give young people the kind of challenging and engaging education that they both need and deserve. These reflections on Teaching Scotland's future 10 years on are far from comprehensive. However, I hope that I have established that our ambitions for young people will only be realised if we invest in our teachers and enable them to use their expertise to the full. The title Teaching Scotland's Future was chosen deliberately to emphasise both that our young people are our future and that our teachers are central to their future success. That basic message remains as true today as it did then. I very much look forward to hearing your reflections and questions about what I've said. Thank you. Graham, thanks very much indeed. Uh, lots of food for thought in what you've said this afternoon and I encourage you all to continue to ask questions uh, via the chat function. It's now my great pleasure to invite uh, uh, John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister, to respond to Graham's presentation and to ask any question or questions uh, he may have arising from it. Mr Swinney. Thank you very much, Ken, and good afternoon, colleagues, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have heard uh, Graham's presentation, and I'll come on to say a little bit about that uh, in a moment, and I thank the General Teaching Council for uh, organising this uh, event this afternoon, which is a really uh, a landmark and appropriate opportunity for us to reflect on some significant issues arising out of Teaching Scotland's future um, in 2011. Uh, before I go on to make some remarks, could I um, start by saying um, th this will probably be the, the last um, fairly public platform that I have um, that I share with Ken Muir uh, prior to his retirement as the uh, Chief Executive of the General Teaching Council and the Registrar um, of the General Teaching Council. And I just want to express uh, my very deep personal thanks to Ken for his service in that role over a number of years uh, and for his continuous service during my time as Education Secretary. I have found Ken your advice at all times um, driven by uh, a determination to uh, contribute good ideas and positive uh, ways forward to support the delivery of education in Scotland and to enhance the uh, the very significant role of the teaching profession and some of the themes that uh, Graham Donaldson has talked about in his report during uh, my time in office and I'm profoundly grateful to you for uh, your help um, and uh, on all occasions. Um, most recently, your help on Friday to make sure that every member of the teaching profession was equipped with detailed information on many of the aspects of resources that are available on remote learning, um, which have been put together by a whole variety of organisations, including Education Scotland, uh, the West of Scotland Partnership, the Tayside Collaborative, uh, the BBC and many others, and your helpfulness in putting that material together on Friday was deeply appreciated as one example of many, many helpful interventions you've made. So Ken, thank you very much for your, um, your service and, uh, and I wish you well for a long and happy retirement. And with those words, I also welcome Polly Stephen to her role as your successor and I look forward very much to working with Pauline in her role in taking forward the, the, the interests and the perspectives of the General Teaching Council. And the General Teaching Council, in a sense, has a pivotal role to, to play in uh, addressing many of the issues that Graham has raised in his lecture and uh, which um, lie at the heart of some of the aspirations which have underpinned many of the directions that I've taken in the last four and a half years to ensure that the teaching profession is able to be centrally influential in the direction of Scottish education. And I think there's some interesting challenges about that that are, are thrown up by the, uh, the issues that Graham raised in his, in his lecture. I think the first of those is in 
that that very deep question about the whole question of the uh, of, of where um, the the drive for innovation and reform and creativity in education comes from. And I think if we look around the world, uh, there can often be um, reforms driven by the political process. Uh, there can be reforms driven by the wider educational debate around the world, and there can be reforms driven by the teaching profession. And in my view, what uh, I've been working to create and what I think is encapsulated by the thinking within Teaching Scotland's future is that essential role of teacher agency, that the teaching profession is viewed to be central to how we uh, advance the thinking and the change that is necessary within uh, the curriculum and within the delivery of education to make sure in the words of uh, that, that Graham used um, that education remains relevant in significantly changing times and we certainly live in those times so that that key observation that Graham made about the importance of an empowered profession being able to exercise teacher agency feels to me to be a central imperative in the delivery of education given that we we know we are going to be living in constantly changing times so therefore that the profession needs to have that confidence uh, and that sense of professional capacity and capability to be able to exercise that role in shaping developments and i think that that gives rise to a couple of pretty significant questions and I want to um, to pull out two of the particular themes that Graham raised in his um, in his contribution, which I think are of particular challenge. Um, one is at the very heart of the values of our education system and one is very much at the heart of the practical development of the profession. And the issue that's right at the heart of uh, the values of our education system. Uh, I wonder, one of the challenges of the curriculum that Graham raised about the challenges to ethical values and understanding, some of which he characterised as challenging the values of the Enlightenment, which have largely stood almost unchallenged in Scotland for 250 years. Yet we find ourselves in a period just now where, and I totally accept the analysis that Graham has put um, in his contribution today of how many wider events, whether they're the, ex the expansion of digital connectivity, the rise of um, alternative media, and um, the challenge of orthodox media, um, and in some respects, the challenge to institutions and processes which uh, I, I think present enormous challenges to uh, our education system. I've been struck, uh, I was very struck by my discussions with modern studies teachers as they went through the delivery of the curriculum during the whole Brexit process, where many modern studies teachers reflected to me that they had largely given up looking at textbooks and just had the BBC Parliament channel on all the time in their classes, engaging young, engaging young people in a debate about the dynamics that were underplayed, particularly when the Brexit process left Parliament and entered the Supreme Court and issues were raised about where, you know, where does power actually lie and how should power be exercised, challenging very much some of the the, the ethical institutional foundations of our society. That poses, I think, for all of us, some really significant um, perspectives about what we hope to achieve out of our education system. And I'm struck by um, the wisdom of the those who created Scotland's curriculum by aligning our curriculum with the values that are written on the mace of the Scottish Parliament, wisdom, compassion, justice and integrity, of essentially recognising the essential link between uh, our education system and our system of 
uh, representative democracy. And I think that connection and reflecting the need for Parliament on perhaps on a you know on a, a reasonably frequent basis should reflect on what are the values that we wish to see in our education system and uh, through that very engaged dialogue and discussion with the profession uh, to ensure uh, uh, and with young people to make sure that our education system is equipping young people with the, uh, the, 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 the to meet the challenges of our times. So the, the ethical debate, I think, is a, a, a very significant challenge, which is um, for all of us in a particular role for Parliament to reflect on from time to time. And then the second more practical um, issue that, that emerges out of Graham's challenges is about how to help teachers um, continue to develop their professionalism uh, in the delivery of education. And I suppose that gets us into some of the real challenges around um, the capacity and the capability for um, members of the teaching profession to be influential in the debate uh, about the development of professional capability and capacity. And a lot of that gets tied up with the fact that, you know, there isn't a teacher in the land that's not enormously busy and burdened. So there is, you know, the, the, the finding of that space, that room to, to think, to breathe, to reflect, to research, to exchange, to collaborate. These are all absolute imperatives in the development of teacher professionalism and con continuous professional development. Uh, but I acknowledge that they're not easy to marshal given the, the pressures and demands on the teaching profession. So I suppose part of what I um, intend to reflect on from the, uh, the, the, the issues that Graham has raised is how we create what Graham described as the deep cultural change that is necessary to encourage teacher agency empowerment and improvement, um, which I, I, I think is an entirely fair and appropriate challenge if we wish to have a profession that is able to exercise the type of leadership and influence that I want the profession to exercise. And I suppose associated with that point is the, the last point that I want to reflect on, which is um, in a sense illustrated by Graham's example of what is the role of universities in school education. Um, but I think th that th the role of our universities in school education raises the whole question of where do we gather together all of the research thinking that is required within Scotland to make sure that our education system is developing um, as strongly and as effectively as we would wish to see it developing, given the particular um, uh, g given the particular challenges of the availability of time and the need to make sure that we create the time and the space to undertake the research and create the opportunities for reflection and collaboration that enable the teaching profession to work with our universities and regional improvement collaboratives and with, our, um, with other stakeholders in education to properly formulate the direction that we can take in the future. And um, so creating that space to enable reflection to look ahead is a central challenge in what we've got to reflect on from uh, the comments that Graham has raised with us today. But uh, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to have heard Graham and I look forward to listening to the, uh, the points and comments that are raised uh, as part of the question and answer session and in the responses that we hear from Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. Thank you for those reflections, Mr Swinney, and it's, it's Pauline on this occasion and not Ken, but thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to hand over to Graham in a moment because I'm sure Graham will want an opportunity to reflect on the points that you've raised. Graham, I'm sure you want to say a few words around about Mr Swinney's reflections with relation to cultural change, the role of universities, values in education, and there was, there was a lot in there. So I'm going to hand over to you, Graham. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline and, and, uh, and 
many thanks to, to the DFM for uh, responding to, to my thoughts. Um, having been uh, transfixed by CNN uh, over the course of uh, the most of the last week, uh, transfixed and horrified uh, over the course of the, of the last week by events that are unfolding um, in the States and more of which no doubt we'll see in the course of the next few days. Um, reinforced my uh, uh, view uh, that we need as a, as a society and, and, and as an education system to be very clear um, about uh, what we stand for, what the nature of the values um, are that should characterise uh, the nature of the experience that our young people get and, the, and what they bring then forward into their adult lives as the things that will govern their behaviour and of course they will shape the society of the future. So what our young people uh, are getting uh, in the course of their education in terms of their ethical understanding and their values um, will shape the future uh, of our country and, uh, and of, the, of the world more, more generally. Uh, and I'm very conscious that, that, that um, we've, we've kind of, over my career, um, We've not really entered into that debate um, as deeply as we should have done. Uh, uh, as a history and modern studies teacher, um, many, many years ago, but as a history and modern studies teacher, um, these are issues which which um, I face and which we we face as as as, uh, as teachers in terms of of how do we um, address. Uh, highly contested areas about the nature of, of our history uh, and the nature of, of the, the debates that are taking place in society at the moment in ways that help young people to develop their own capacities for critical thinking and, and, and develop their own, um, their own confidence in terms of understanding the importance of uh, the values they have being based on um, a respect for evidence and a desire to interrogate uh, the kind of things that, that are being uh, wished upon them, whether that becomes through social media or mainstream media or politicians or people like me, um, that they have the confidence and capacity to, to, to be critical um, uh, listeners and, and, and participators in that, in that debate. And I, I think we've, we have, um, as an education system, um, not thought deeply enough about that. And I think uh, without um, being too grandiose about it, I think the risk is that, that what we've seen in the States in the last wee while um, uh, heightens the need for us to do so and to do so with a real sense of purpose and vigour. So I absolutely, I'm, I'm delighted that, that, uh, 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 that, that John uh, picked, picked up that part of what I said because I think it's incredibly, um, incredibly important. Uh, and part of that, I, I think, and, and uh, John talked about the the uh, uh, the way in which teachers can and should uh, be players in terms of the, the the debate, the political debate that takes place uh, about uh, the nature and purposes of school education and the way in which um, that, that is is conducted. Um, uh, and to some extent, I, I, I suppose, uh, and this is this is. Um, you know, not quite a mere cool but it's a kind of reflection uh, that I think we've, we've, as a profession, um, been a little bit supine uh, over the course of the last 20 or 30 years uh, in the extent to which education has become such a highly contested area uh, uh, of, of the political debate. And yet the profession's role in that has tended to be to complain on the sidelines about what comes out of it rather than uh, to be players in terms of helping to shape it. And I think it's very important uh, that, that we see ourselves as a profession, as, as taking up the invitation that the Deputy First Minister has, has articulated uh, about being constructive players in this process uh, rather than, than reluctant implementers of what comes out of that, often reluctant implementers of what comes out of that process. So again, I think that is, is, uh, is just uh, is so important. Um, and, and the whole uh, issue of research, I think, is, is, is part of that. And it's not research in a kind of very, very uh, formal sense, but it's research that's reflected in the idea of being a reflective practitioner. It's, 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 uh, it, 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 it's learning um, and wanting to learn 
uh, from the kind of, of experience which uh, we're giving to our young people and, and be constantly seeking uh, as much uh, insight as we can get from wherever we can get it in order to ensure that we can improve the quality of what we're giving to our, our young people. Uh, and the whole concept of research in its, in its broadest sense, I think, is absolutely at the heart of that. Um, so, so Jean, I was very, very heartened by the kind of things that you were saying in response to, to, uh, uh, to, to my opening um, remarks. Uh, and I very much hope that, 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 that the profession itself uh, will feel um, confident enough in what I think in the decade to come and beyond is going to be an incredibly turbulent period uh, for us all, that the profession will be confident enough, as I say, to be to, to help to shape and influence that debate of education rather than, than, than to simply be receivers of what comes out of that debate. Pauline, that's my that's my initial thoughts in response to what the DFM said. Thanks, Graham. Um, as you know, we asked you all if you had questions in advance of today and we, we received a great number of questions. Uh, which we're incredibly grateful for. There is also the opportunity to add some questions to the chat function, which we can see, and we will endeavour to ask Graham as many of those as possible. Graham, one of the areas that we've received a number of um, questions as you've been speaking this afternoon in the chat is around about initial teacher education. A couple of questions I'm going to draw to your attention in particular. One from Donald Gillis at University of West of Scotland about what your views are of the pros and cons of moving to an all masters teaching profession. And that's complemented by a question from David Smith from the University of Aberdeen, who chairs the, the deans, um, who is asking questions about the possibilities of combining initial teacher education and teacher induction within university programmes to support um, one overall experience and possibly open up opportunities for masters and um, stronger relationships and stronger theory and practice reinforcement. So it'd be useful to have um, an opportunity to hear a bit more from you about initial teacher education and the role of master's education, which you mentioned earlier. Over to you. Yes, Teaching Sort of the Future um, obviously ad address this this question about uh, master's level profession. It's interesting that, that uh, Scotland, I think, um, internationally uh, has uh, prided itself on the extent to which the teaching profession um, became an all graduate profession and was seen internationally as being at the forefront of creating a, 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 a teaching profession uh, which was uh, focused on young people, but was also intellectually curious uh, and intellectually demanding in terms of, of how it went about its business. Um, it's interesting now that Scotland is becoming um, one of a relatively small number of countries that doesn't see the teaching teaching as a master's level profession. Um, and I, I think that's that's an interesting observation in terms of what's happening uh, uh, elsewhere, although the, the, these international comparisons are often quite hard to make in terms of, of what we mean, uh, what is necessarily meant by master's level. Um, what, what Teaching Scotland's Future um, uh, said that the kind of, of uh, challenge, intellectual challenge uh, for both um, policy and practice, which is embedded, embedded in, a, in a teacher's everyday job, um, uh, requires uh, learning uh, which is at master's level in, in terms of the kind of, of uh, levels that we talk about in, in university education. Uh, TSF didn't say that we ought to move immediately to making teachers an all teaching an, an all masters profession, but it did say that the nature of the professional learning which we engage in uh, should be at that level of complexity and should be addressing the kind of complex issues which would be would be um, relevant in the context of, of uh, masters level learning, and that uh, given that that is the case, that we need to find uh, better ways of accrediting what teachers were doing as part of their day and daily business. Universities are accrediting that in order that you could get, uh, you could acquire um, a master's degree by doing the kind of things that were relevant and directly relevant uh, to your day to day uh, job. And we have seen, uh, I think, uh, uh, moves in, in that direction over the course of, of the, uh, the last week while. I, I, I do think we need to go 
further than that. And I, I think um, I was interested in the extent to which the, um, the, the, <coughs> the seven universities in Wales were actually able to work together uh, uh, collectively in order to arrive at a single master's degree that's then um, offered in each of the, the seven universities. And that degree was intended to directly um, uh, help to reinforce and equip teachers to deal with the education reform programme in uh, in Wales. And I think that 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 it's that kind of thinking. It's not not a model, but it's a kind of thinking that I I, uh, I, I would I think we need to pursue uh, pursue further. The bit about ITE and induction, well, that, that was right at the heart of, of um, uh, what TSF was talking about. The initial phase of a teacher's career, the formation of a teacher was so important uh, prior to 2010. I mean, Scotland was well ahead of the game in terms of, of uh, introducing the, the formal induction process for, for, uh, for new teachers in a very, uh, very structured way. Uh, but what was very evident back in 2010 was that um, once that induction process was finished, um, what happened thereafter could bear little or no relationship uh, to building on, on the learning that had taken place in the induction. So what, what Teaching Scotland's Future was calling for was a much more coherent uh, approach to initial teacher education induction and the next two or three years of a, of a teacher's career and that initial phase of, of, a, of a, teacher's, um, a teacher's career. Um, uh, because that's when beliefs and habits become cemented. And once beliefs and habits have become cemented, they are very hard to change. Uh, so we should be um, uh, investing heavily in ensuring that those early years, those, those formative years uh, uh, of, of, our, of our teachers uh, uh, instill the kind of um, insights, beliefs and habits uh, which are going to then serve them well uh, for the rest of their career. And therefore I would continue to advocate strongly uh, that we need to uh, make sure that that induction, uh, that initial teacher education induction, and then the next uh, two or three years through to about the first five years of a teacher's career, uh, we see as a, as, a, as a consistent and coherent experience uh, for our teachers as the, as the platform, as the springboard for lifelong, for career long uh, professional learning. Thanks, Graham. Um, you mentioned there about um, establishing beliefs and habits as an early careers teacher, and we had a question submitted from Roseanne uh, Fitzpatrick in Highland, who is asking about professional learning and to what extent you feel uh, knowledge, understanding and skills around about coaching, mentoring, practitioner inquiry have moved on since the publication of your report. And what do you think has been the impact on our learners and the profession? And just because I'm trying to roll questions together, that is complemented by a question by David uh, McKellar from Education Scotland, who is asking, what are your thoughts on um, career long professional learning, where, it, where it's gone well, what are development needs, but particularly within relation to inclusion and additional support needs. So general theme there, Graham, about professional learning, how far we've moved on and maybe what's to come next. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the, the evidence we would have was, would, would partly relate to, to that impact study that, that uh, was carried out in 2015, which uh, made the, the, the very bold statement that the teaching profession has risen to the challenge set out in Teaching Scotland's Future. And it went on to, to talk about there'd been a move away uh, from professional learning as going in a course, a greater focus, fo a greater focus on the impact of professional learning on pupils, um, the whole business about, about professional dialogue being much more uh, characteristic now of the way in which teachers went about their, their, uh, their job and a greater willingness uh, uh, and receptiveness to new approaches and thinking differently about um, uh, uh, the nature of, of, of how we serve our children well. And that latter point, I, I suppose, goes to the beliefs and habits point that if, if if that finding is accurate and there, there is a greater willingness and that is something that has continued to take place since 2015, uh, then that would suggest that the, that the, the process of, of uh, creating a context within which we're not afraid of challenge um, uh, and we see constructive dialogue um, uh, within the profession as being something which is entirely healthy. Um, if, I, if I reflect back on uh, uh, my uh, early years in the classroom, um, 
my recollection uh, is that uh, uh, there's only one reason that you would leave your classroom door open, and that was to prove that your discipline was good, that the kids weren't rioting inside that classroom. Um, the notion that you would leave the classroom door open on the assumption that anyone might have anything to offer you in terms of the nature of how you actually went about your job or you might have anything to offer anybody else was not part of the culture uh, at all. And actually, um, in some ways, the most profoundly unintellectual places to be were school staff rooms where, you know, if anyone was engaging in anything that suggested that they were um, thinking more deeply about education, then they were obviously out for promotion or uh, were seeing something, you know, there, was, there had to be an angle for it rather than that being an integral part of what it meant to be a professional. We are light years away from from uh, from the way things were um, uh, then. And, and I think the whole process of uh, 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 the openness to to learning, uh, to understanding that that um, uh, we moved away from in-service training where teachers were trained to implement something to a process where we now talk about teacher education rather than teacher training. We talk about the process by which teachers grow and develop throughout their career uh, and where uh, certainly the evidence, albeit has to be anecdotal uh, since 2015, but the evidence that, that I'm seeing um, is that that has continued to be um, a characteristic of the way in which the profession has, has moved forward in the course of the last uh, uh, the last uh, decade. So, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really I'm optimistic about about the, the way in which the, the profession has embraced or is embracing that whole notion of, of uh, collaboration, working together, seeing professional learning as being integral to being a professional uh, and not assuming that uh, experience uh, is about length of, of time in the classroom, but experience is about growth, uh, the way you've grown through that period. So it's not 20 years experience is not one year's experience 20 times, but but, but has actually uh, reflects growth and development uh, over the over over a career. Um, so again, you know, in, in response to both of those questions, I, I would I would be cautiously optimistic that we've moved in that direction. I think it's fragile. Uh, I think the pressures that, are, that teachers are under, the pressures that they have been under in the course of the last 10 months are absolutely enormous. As somebody uh, who is, is outside the classroom and only able to observe it, uh, I, I have to say my, my uh, admiration uh, for the profession has grown hugely uh, in, in that period. Um, and I know from, from personal contacts with, with uh, grandchildren and others um, uh, that the, the, the way in which that schools have learned a heck of a lot in terms of how to use the technology in order to engage young people in their uh, their learning. And, and as I said um, in, in my remarks, I, I think that creates a platform uh, for uh, a better use of, of, of uh, the digital world than might have been the case had we not had the pandemic. So necessity can be the mother of invention. Thanks, Graham. Um, just a wee reminder, if you're putting a question in the chat, it'd be really helpful if you could put your name um, in there so that I can give you a shout out basically when we're when we're doing this. But as you were talking there, Graham, there's a there's a number of questions that have that have come in that really I think relate to the point you made in the lecture around about a call for deep cultural change, which Mr. Swinney asked about, and we talked a little bit about the role of universities in that space. Mark Breslin from Glasgow asked in advance of the lecture if you feel we need a shift or a bridge between academic knowledge and practitioner knowledge. And some of the conversation in the chat function is really asking where do teachers find the time and space and resource to do that well? So if professional learning is to play a part in that cultural change, how do we do it well? Yeah, and, and professional learning is right at the heart of that uh, of that uh, uh, cultural change. So um, uh, I'm absolutely clear about uh, the, the importance of, of creating the conditions uh, that allow that uh, to take place. And I think we do need uh, uh, a debate and that becomes a political debate uh, about um, the way in which uh, uh, we expect teachers to use their time and how we create uh, the space within the contract in order for teachers to be able to um, engage in the kind of, of, of uh, uh, learning which is, is directed towards improving the quality of what children experience. Um, 
I think for for far too long we've kind of almost implicitly assumed um, that 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 uh, to be a good teacher is something which um, you simply are born with, or it's a personality thing. Uh, the reality is that the complexity of what we're talking about today, in terms of as we talked about earlier, the kind of issues that underpin um, the values that we're trying to to transmit to young people, the kind of of uh, complexity of the context that we're working within, understanding the complexity of young people's lives and the backgrounds that they come from, the importance of context in terms of of taking young people's learning forward. All of that requires our teachers to be able to have the time to think about that in the context of the young people they have in, in front of them. If we don't do that, then inevitably what you what you you have to do as a teacher is is to see a class as a class rather than to see a, a collection of, of individuals, each of whom um, has their own particular um, needs uh, and their own and, and their own particular um, ways in which they have to be uh, uh, assisted in, in, the, in the process both of learning and, and, and well-being. So I think it's a debate we need to have. I think uh, in some ways um, the Macron report back in 2001 um, opened up this debate, uh, but I think unfortunately it, it created a mechanistic response uh, 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 and, and we didn't get the cultural response, the cultural change that was needed to 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 go with that and i think we do need now to be to have that discussion about how do we get quality how do we help our, our teachers to be able to engage with young people in a way uh, that goes beyond you know inspiration and and relying on your own intuition and and uh, uh, and experience but actually can reflect and think about diagnose uh, better the needs of individual young people. There's, there's examples in terms of, say, lesson study in in, uh, in Japan, uh, in which uh, that can't happen all the time. But it's an example of, in the same way as as in the medical profession, you plan an operation, um, and that involves a team thinking about the nature of, of of the complex cases that they're dealing with. We need we need to to think through what that means in education. What does that mean in terms of of uh, dealing with the complexity of, 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 the, of the modern classroom and the modern education system. Um, so I do think we need culture change and I think if we're going to get that culture change we can't escape uh, asking questions about the nature of, of uh, uh, how teachers can best spend the, the finite amount of time uh, which they have to do the job. Thanks, Graeme. As well as time and space, a, a particular question that has come into the chat here is um, from Michelle Lewis. Michelle is from Dundee and has a lot of involvement in the regional collaborative in, in Tayside. And we had a number of questions submitted in advance about the structural supports and the agency supports that are in place for individual teachers to find that time and space. And Michelle's particularly asking, Graeme, about what you see as the role of regional improvement collaboratives in developing practitioners and capacity across the system. There might be something there that you want to reflect on in terms of system supports um, for um, supporting that cultural change. Yeah, I think the introduction of, of the regional improvement collaboratives um, into the, the uh, landscape of Scottish education um, is, is a really uh, interesting uh, development because it, it um, expresses in, in, a, in a very direct way uh, the, uh, the importance of collaboration and, and creating that context uh, across um, the authorities and each of the each of the collaboratives. Now, as I said in the lecture, my experience is most extensively with um, the West Partnership, where myself and, and uh, Chris Chapman uh, uh, sit on the board of the, of the West Partnership and act as critical friends to uh, the eight directors of education that um, uh, are, are on that board. Uh, and I think that the the, um, the, the nature uh, what I've seen over the course of, of uh, time that, that uh, I've been engaged with with West Partnership um, is an increasing uh, understanding uh, uh, or confidence, should I say, in terms of, of uh, sharing across the authorities. Um, I think uh, I think this is true of all of the collaboratives. There's, there, there may be some kind of initial uh, 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 implicit territorialism in the process, but I think that 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 structurally, my my perception is that is changing, and that the 
we're getting a better understanding of those things which are best done directly by the by each local authority itself and those things that can be enhanced by local authorities um, working together, uh, sharing sharing expertise and in some cases sharing resources. And, and, and uh, based on what I've seen so far, uh, I'm uh, uh, quite optimistic uh, about the way in which the, the RICs might uh, become uh, a more permanent feature of the of the of the landscape as a reflection, as an embodiment of the importance of um, importance of collaboration. So that 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 um, uh, that development uh, maybe illustrates um, the way in which uh, uh, government uh, can help to create the context within which things become possible that otherwise would rely on individual um, initiative. We've always had a little bit of collaboration both between authorities and, and I mean uh, that that's not something that is is uh, unheard of. Uh, but by creating the, the frame, framework of, of, uh, of RICs, I think uh, it, government has, has uh, very much um, uh, indicated that, that this is something which, they, which government sees as very important and has created the context within which it, it can happen. And I would hope that as we move forward, uh, we'll improve our understanding of, of what's the appropriate relationship between, for example, a body, uh, central body like Education Scotland uh, and the RICs and how can uh, how can national bodies, the RICs and local authorities, how can we get that kind of collaborative working uh, at the national uh, intermediate and uh, local level, um, which capitalises on, on, the, on the unique contributions which each can offer um, and doesn't duplicate. And I think I, and, and, um, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about that uh, in terms of, of uh, where we are now and what I've seen of the RICs at work gives me reason, I think, to be uh, more optimistic than probably I was at the when the, at, at the outset in terms of their original creation. Thanks, Graham. You spoke a bit there about being optimistic about the future, and um, Billy Burke, head teacher from Renfrewshire, has a specific question for you about what are your hopes for the next five years for the teaching profession in Scotland, and are there any changes you would have hoped that you would have seen by now? Well, the next five, we can't separate the next five years from what effect the, the experience of the pandemic will have um, on as we move through and beyond uh, the, uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, I, I do think that the, the nature of the experience that we've had in the last 10 months, um, and it's become almost a truism, uh, ha has acted as a, as a catalyst that, that that uh, um, trends that were already evident uh, have been accelerated dramatically uh, by the impact of the pandemic, and nowhere is that more obvious uh, than in the uh, the uh, the way in which um, digital connectivity has allowed um, aspects of of schooling to continue in ways that had this been had we had this pandemic ten years ago, would have been simply impossible. I just do not know uh, how we would have, have managed uh, to engage in the kind of, of uh, a continuation of, or ways of trying to counteract the interrupted learning which the, the pandemic has, has uh, necessitated, how we would have done that had it not been for digital connectivity. So I think, I think um, uh, all of us, uh, myself included, have seen possibilities uh, now in relation to digital learning which would have would have happened anyway, but would have taken a while uh, uh, for it to to work its way into the the system. Uh, I think also, as with all as happens in in uh, in all periods of national emergency, um, there's been a, a an acceleration of investment and creativity, uh, which which will last beyond the uh, the pandemic. And I I know that in terms of of uh, uh, the commercial world that there has been there is an increasing um understanding of of uh, uh, the possibilities of 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 providing support to to uh, to schools and to the education system in in ways that previously might have met with resistance but now people might see possibilities so the future is not that, that the digital world replaces schools and replaces teachers schools and teachers seems to me will remain right at the heart of uh, the, the uh, you know a learning community a community of learners 
uh, where the well-being of young people is right at the heart of that of that uh, community. Uh, but that sh that that will 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 happen um, in ways that, that allow greater use of um, a wider range of resources, which which digital connectivity uh, allows us to to um, to engage in. And, and I, I just wonder if if um, if we think of, if we think about um, in the past um, how uh, asp aspiring families have been able to support their young people. A critical part of that was the, the growth of libraries throughout the 19th and 20th century. Libraries were incredibly important um, uh, as a way of, of, of uh, allowing young people who wouldn't necessarily have lots of books inside the house, but actually could get access to it, to it through the library. I think in terms of the digital world, we need to have the same kind of thinking. How do we create the kind of community resources that means that a young person's ability to engage with the digit with digital learning and independent learning digitally is not um, uh, constrained by the nature of of, of their own particular uh, family background, and I, th I I I really hope that that is part of the uh, political debate as we move forward, because of course that obviously has implications for um, for resources. Thanks, Graham. You mentioned in the lecture earlier about seeking to get a balance between internal and external assessments. So some of the folk attended today must have been able to see into the future and know that you were going to mention that because we've had lots of questions about the role of formal exams um, with just the basic question, are formal exams necessary and folk interested in what your views are there? Yeah, no, there's an interesting question. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the reason we have formal examinations, the reason that, that, that they, they occupy such an important place in, uh, in the education system uh, is because um, uh, there, there, there has to be or, or there is a selection function uh, that the education system provides, a service the education system provides for society. And examinations are a way of, uh, uh, as fairly as, as you can, um, trying to capture the learning of, of, of young people um, uh, in a way that doesn't, that, 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 as I say, is as fair as possible uh, 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 and is less open to the, to the, the uh, vagaries that can happen in terms of all the individual uh, contexts within which uh, young people are actually, their learning is actually taking place. Um, so, uh, external assessment uh, 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 and of which examinations are one part, external assessment uh, as a means of ensuring fairness um, remains important. Um, but I can remember in, in, in debates inside the inspectorate when we were talking about this and, and uh, uh, colleagues in the inspectorate who are more expert in this than I am, um, telling me that the best, the best way the uh, that you can uh, achieve both validity and reliability uh, is to find ways of combining external and internal assessment. Um, external assessment, as I say, is important for fairness, but internal assessment properly done allows us to access um, aspects of learning, which is extremely difficult to capture in terms of a, of a formal examination. Um, so I think we, we need to um, I would hope that, that arising from the experience of, of, of now two examination diets which have not been able to take place, um, that we could have a, have a, 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 a discussion about uh, what have we learned about um, teacher assessment, internal assessment in that process. Uh, uh, how can we uh, move forward in ways that increase the validity and that is the breadth of learning which we capture in terms of our qualification system fairly uh, and we do that by, by, by exploring this relationship between internal and external assessment and being more willing perhaps to, to uh, engage in, 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 in arriving at a better balance um, um, between the two. So I, I think um, external assessment remains important. Uh, I think internal assessment is also important and the challenge is to get the right balance uh, between the two. Thanks, Graeme. Um, Ruth Mackay, head teacher at Portobello High School, is asking, 
What's your advice about how radical should we be? Might our current emerging experience with digital pedagogies lead to a revision of the proportion of time senior phase young people spend in school? Could a blended approach free us to realise the ambition of developing the young workforce, increase the level of independence amongst young people and create more time for teachers to engage in research and reflection? You mentioned in the lecture it's 15 years of CFE. Um, how radical should we be? Well, I think we should be as radical as we need to be. I mean, we shouldn't be radical for its own sake, um, but nor should we uh, be afraid to to um, uh, learn from the experience of of of, uh, of the last pe ten months uh, and uh, try to use it as constructively as we can to uh, build forward in terms of of uh, uh, how we might uh, uh, how we might provide the right balance and blend of um, uh, sources for young people's learning as they as they move forward. As I said earlier, the teacher in the school will remain uh, as the heart of that, as the as the orchestrator of that process. Uh, but I'm, I'm acutely aware that for many young people um, in advantaged backgrounds, um, the period uh, of the last 10 months will have uh, opened their eyes to possibilities for independent learning, uh, which previously um, the, the the, the requirements of 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 day to day schooling would have have uh, greatly inhibited. Uh, I think that genie's out the bottle, um, uh, and it's a good genie. Um, so I I, th I think the challenge is to say, um, how can we ensure that that um, ability to learn independently is open to all young people? What do we need to put in place in order for that to to happen? And the kind of things. Um, uh, uh, that were referred to, I think, should 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 be part of the debate, and I think that that kind of thinking, being creative about it, um, in terms of of uh, how we get the, the blend and balance right, and how we can use technology um, to allow teachers um, to focus on those things that teachers do best, uh, uh, those things that 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 uh, in terms of the interpersonal aspect of of being part of a community and being part of a community that's devoted to learning. Um, all of that uh, seems to me to be of critical importance, but technology, it doesn't seem, it seems to me not a threat in that process. Technology is, is, is uh, not, uh, increasingly, uh, we can see the potential of that uh, to help us get that, that, that balance right. And yes, um, within that, it might well create opportunities uh, for um, teacher time to be used a bit differently uh, in relation to, to uh, you know the rhythm of the of the day, the week, the month, and the year, um, and technology um, in all sorts of ways in terms of, of professional learning, networking, collaboration, uh, uh, the fact that we, that that uh, we've got a, th a thousand people enrolled for for today's discussion, um, it seems to me indicates that we're now moving into a period where. We really need to harness this technology uh, uh, and, and have, a, have a major national effort to move forward in it. There are countries um, that are already are way ahead of us in that. Estonia is a good example. Estonia does incredibly well in PISA, but is also a very digitally um, uh, uh, savvy uh, country in terms of, of its education system. Uh, so we, so the, the, these, these, this, this whole thing is not a question of, of uh, things that are threats or things that are um, we should see as, as as being problematic. I think there are real opportunities, real opportunities, uh, if we are prepared to engage openly in the debate and not be not be too defensive. Thanks, Graham. Uh, um, we've got about ten more question, um, ten more minutes rather for questions. Mm -hmm. And I was going to get carried away and say that we're trending on Twitter. I'm sure we're not trending on Twitter, but one of the, the central themes that people are asking questions about in particular relate to additional support needs, Graham. So there is discussion around about with approximately a third of our children and young people um, having some form of additional support needs. How can Scottish teacher education better respond to that? And how do you see um, GERFEC being um, enacted in practice well consistently and, and really be lived as opposed to a set of principles? 
Ten minutes, you said, was it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got a few more to throw in, so, so you know. <laughs> um, well, some of the things that I touched on in the lecture, I think, are are are, uh, are relevant to this. And, and, and it did. It was when I talked about complexity, or, or the, the complexity of the teacher's job. Um, uh, a significant part of that complexity is in being able to uh, diagnose, support, respond to uh, the diverse needs of of uh, of all young people, uh, and of course those. Uh, with additional support needs of, of a whole variety of kinds um, are right at the heart of that. And that's 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 partly what lay behind what I said about um, uh, thinking carefully about time. Uh, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, we've learned a heck of a lot. I mean, when I, uh, early on in, in, in my career, uh, we had what was a step change, a, 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 an incredibly important step change in how we, how we uh, addressed uh, additional support needs and children with special educational needs. 1978, the inspector produced a report, I wasn't in the inspector at that time, um, about supporting young people additional learning needs. And it made the point that, that, that this is something that is not confined to a very small number of young people, but is something that is increasingly uh, all young people in, in different ways have additional support needs. And then we have the Warnock report. Uh, in, in, in 1980, which produced a sea change in terms of, of how we thought about special educational needs. When I started teaching, sorry, this is, this is an old man talking about the past, but when I started teaching, um, we had modified children in mo it's the mainstream schools. We had modified children. So you would have children will be sorted out into, into separate um, classes based on, on the perception of how they were going to go. And then you would have this group of young people uh, that received a modified curriculum. Um, uh, and uh, they were they were compartmentalised. They were put away in terms of, of how we dealt with them. Um, wh what's happened over the course of the last last uh, 30, 40 years has has has, has transformed our thinking uh, about uh, the uh, young people's needs and, and learning and increasingly we're also understanding better uh, about the impact of of, uh, of disadvantage and um, you know language uh, development in the home and all that kind of thing which is is, uh, is so important so I do think um, that that part of the discussion we need to have about the nature of the profession uh, is the profession is not simply about instruction. Uh, and when people think about teachers, they tend to think, think of somebody standing in front of a class, uh, hopefully doing a very good job at engaging that class in terms of, of whatever it is the subject of the lesson is. Um, uh, and of course that for many, for, for, for decades has been the, the kind of, of expectation of teachers. But I think uh, uh, we're now increasingly aware that the job is much more complex than that uh, and that we need to uh, engage Using research evidence from from universities, uh, using uh, using the whole notion of collaborative uh, uh, learning with with within a school out and out of a school, uh, all teachers being seen as as teachers uh, of young people with additional support needs. But that doesn't mean to say you're just told to get on with it. That 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 requires creating the conditions uh, for all teachers to be able to engage. Um, uh, with with meeting the needs of of, uh, of young people in, in in all their complexity, so I think the questions are are, are absolutely spot on. Uh, I think we have come a long way, uh, uh, but we still have quite a long way to go. And again, that seems to me needs to be part of both the professional and the political debate uh, 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 as we move out of the pandemic. Thanks, Graham. Another area where I think we would recognise we have a long way to go is with regard to diversity in the teaching workforce. And there are some questions relating to the role of leadership in fully representing um, all aspects of our communities. Um, obviously, we're, we have a, a teaching workforce that isn't reflective of our general population. Be interesting to have your reflections around about that particular issue and increasing diversity in the workforce of teachers. Yeah, and that that partly goes back to what I was saying about entry to the profession and so on, and and the the considerations that we need to have about um, uh, what our teaching workforce should look like and 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 how we encourage 
um, uh, the kind of diversity which we need in the in the profession in terms of entry to the profession. Uh, and I think again that's an area where we need to redouble our efforts in terms of, of uh, making teaching um, a, 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 an attractive career uh, uh, to as broad a range of, of, of uh, people as, as, as have the best interests of uh, young people at at, uh, at heart, so 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 entry becomes incredibly important in in in, in all of that, and of course um, uh, we need to be in a position where those who are in significant positions, uh, uh, formal positions inside schools and and uh, and beyond, uh, increasingly reflect uh, the diversity of Scottish society that, that that's there. Uh, if if uh, you know if if I had the answer to this. Uh, and could just simply say, just do this, and everything will be fine. Then um, I suspect you would all think I'd gone mad. Uh, so this, this is this is this is this is difficult. Uh, but the important thing, going back to culture change, the important thing is we establish the the the, the culture within which um, diversity is celebrated and not something which um, people uh, find difficult to cope with. Thanks, Graham. I'm going to ask you um, what I think will be the final question. And um, it's been a, a year of disruption for all sorts of people and one particular group um, of um, people who are have had been impacted on significantly are student teachers and people who are aspiring to be teachers. What's your best piece of advice for student teachers or those aspiring to be teachers? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I suppose at heart, uh, the best piece of advice is um, enjoy the job. Um, you know, teaching is is a, an amazingly rewarding uh, profession. Uh, I, I know in conversations with with uh, colleagues over the course of the last week, while um, schools without children uh, are 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 pretty barren places, you know. They're 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 not the kind of of uh, it's not it's not what people come into teaching for, um, and and being part of that community um, of learning is so important. But the single most important piece of advice I think I would give to any um, uh, a new teacher is never be complacent. Never be complacent. Continue to be restless, intellectually restless, continue to learn and grow professionally throughout your career uh, and be demanding uh, of others in terms of um, helping uh, that professional growth, both individually and collectively. So working with colleagues and working individually, that whole business of being committed to learning, committing to growing uh, uh, and hungry to learn throughout a career in order to better serve the young people of Scotland uh, is the single most important piece of advice that I would give to, to any um, uh, entrant to the profession. Thank you, Graham. Great, great note to end on. And um, it falls to me now to, to, to close the lecture today. And I want to thank everybody for taking part and for engaging in the question and answer session. It's been really great. We have had far more questions that we've been able to deal with, so we'll have a think about how we might want to use some of those to continue um, this discussion and this debate. A very special thank you also to our worldwide participants who've either had a very early or a very early start or they've stayed up into the wee hours to, to listen to this. And I think some very important conversations have been start, started and as Graham suggested earlier, we need to continue to find the space together for the professional debate to influence educational change. I would draw your attention to um, this, um, the January version of the Teaching Scotland magazine, which should be either through your door, your door box today, which mine was, or in your inbox where um, Ken's last keynote as Chief Executive of the General Teaching Council calls for us to consider a cultural and mindset shift in order to do what we need to do to continue to improve Scottish education. I'd encourage you to continue discussion via the hashtag GTCSAL21 and very much hope that our discussions help shape the future direction of travel for education. The lecture itself and the Q&A session 
will be available shortly on the GTC Scotland website, as will the transcript of Graham's lecture, which we'll make available very soon. And as with any such event, there are a number of people that I want to say a th quick thank you to, starting with Dario Amaranto from Glowcast and the Glowcast team who filmed Graham's presentation and who did all the technical wizardry in the background to make this lecture happen today. I want to say a huge thank you to my colleagues in GTC Scotland, particularly the education and the communications and digital teams, in particular Fraser, Fraser Shand, who's led the organising of this lecture from our end. And I want to say a huge thank you to Elaine Napier, Charlene Simpson and Jacqueline Morley, who facilitated much of the engagement with teachers and partners as we move towards new professional standards for teachers. And I want to say a great big thank you to the large number of registrants and colleagues who've engaged with us during the various consultations and forum groups that have produced what I think are a great set of professional standards that we've launched today. The engagement in those um, focus groups and in those discussions, I personally found incredibly uplifting. And finally, our thanks go to John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister, for taking part in the lecture, and of course to Graham, Professor Graham Donaldson, for an inspiring and thought-provoking lecture and for helping to set an agenda that I'm sure we will all continue to engage with over the coming months and years as we all strive collectively to do our very best in teaching Scotland's future. Thank you for your engagement. Have a lovely evening. Keep safe, keep talking and I don't know how to finish meetings now other than wave so I'm going to wave and say <laughs> bye to everybody and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.